When the disciples began to speak in other languages they had never formally known or studied through the power of God's Spirit, was that a miracle? That's the power of God. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Message today, the purpose of Pentecost. Pentecost was a holiday that came 50 days after the Passover. It had an Old Testament uh, meaning and a New Testament fulfillment, and it's relevant to us today in the last age of the church. Now, I want to read this story. We started with it in our scripture reading, but I'd like you to join me in reading Je uh, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to probably read verses 1 through 11. Now, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. These are the disciples and the apostles. There's 120 in all. They had just recently replaced Judas, who had committed suicide. They cast lots between two men, and they chose Matthias to take his place. As soon as that happened, and they're praying, they've resumed that number of 12. They've been in this upper room for 10 days, the Holy Spirit is poured out on them. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because every one of them heard them speak in their own language. Then they were amazed and they marveled and said to one another, Look, are not these who speak Galileans? How is it that we each man hear in our own language wherein we were born? Perivians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors of Rome and Jews, proselytes, Jews by birth, proselytes are converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we, and it mentions 16 different language groups there if you count them. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? Others, there's always some in the crowd, mocking says, oh, they're, they're full of new wine. The Bible compares the outpouring of the Spirit to rain. And in the Hebrew economy, the rain came in two great waves. And uh, the early rain was a good downpour that would basically sprout the seed, and it would happen in November. These are their winter crops, like the grain. It would grow through the winter season, and then you'd have the latter rain that would plump the ear during the springtime, and prepare it for the harvest. And so the Lord, after sowing the seed, you know, Jesus began his ministry in the fall during the time of the former rain, preached three and a half years. He finished his ministry in the spring during the time of the latter rain. He said to his disciples, do not go anywhere yet. Abide in Jerusalem until you receive the promised comforter. And he gave them some special instructions when he ascended to heaven. So we're going to talk about that ascending and descending. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days. How long? And speaking of these things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after Jesus died... He did not go directly to heaven. But over a period of how long? 40 days. Forty days from his crucifixion and his resurrection, he remained, he continued to appear to the disciples, and every time he appeared, he taught them. Isn't it interesting that the ministry of Christ begins with 40 days of not eating and fasting, and the ministry of Christ ends, his earthly ministry, 
with another 40 days where he does eat and he teaches. Now at the end of that 40 days, the Holy Spirit didn't come yet. It came at Pentecost. Pentecost was a time when they celebrated the latter rain and the harvest. You've got Passover, and then after Passover, well, let me read it to you in the Bible, Leviticus 23, 15. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, speaking of the Passover, from that day that you brought the sheaf, the wave offering, even seven Sabbaths. How many days in a week? So seven Sabbaths is how many days? Seven times seven? Forty-nine. But they add one more. The day after the Sabbath is that one additional day for a total of 50 days. The word penta, like building in Washington, D.C., where all the military does its stuff, is called the what? Why? Why is it called the Pentagon? Five sides, like a, a pentagram, five-sided stars. Penta. Pentagon has got five sides. And so Pentecost was this special holiday that came 50 days after Passover, a time to celebrate the harvest. Well, God was about to give the church its first harvest after Jesus had been sowing the gospel seed for three and a half years. It doesn't happen immediately after he ascends. Christ ascends to heaven. He says, wait in Jerusalem. You read in chapter 1 of Acts. He says, wait in Jerusalem. Don't go preaching yet. You can't be doing the work of God without the power of God said be praying and waiting for the power of God you'll know you need the comforter I've got to go God the Son that I might send God the Spirit and he will empower you why does God give us the Holy Spirit what's the principal reason he gives us the Holy Spirit Jesus said I will give you power that you might be my witnesses Acts chapter 1 verse 8 the reason he sent the Holy Spirit is so they could witness for what purpose? To bring others, that there might be a harvest of souls. What would be the most important time in history for God to prepare the world for a harvest? Wouldn't that be just before he shows up with a sickle? Doesn't Revelation say when Jesus comes, he's got a sickle? What do you do with a sickle? Anyone remember before they had John Deere what they did with sickles? They harvest. Some of you who grew up in the old country of Germany or Russia with these big scythes, What's the symbol on the Russian flag, the communist flag? It was the hammer and the sickle because that's how they used to harvest. They'd take a little grain, they'd, go, they'd chop it, and they'd, they'd stack it in bundles, they'd chop it, and it was a very sharp, curved knife. Jesus is coming with a sickle to harvest. So do we need an outpouring of his spirit to prepare the crop just before he comes? So we really need the same experience of Pentecost. God wants to take of the spirit of Jesus and put it on his people again. Now you know one reason I'm talking about this now is because I'm looking at the world around us. Everything from volcanoes to earthquakes to the moral decay in our society and our church. Amen. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, you're going to come pretty soon, but something very important is missing. Your people need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not like God has a clock up in the sky. He's watching, and when it hits that right moment, the Holy Spirit falls. He's waiting on us. He wants to send it. And each of us can experience a revival. The church is a collection of people. If you want to see revival in the church, you need revival. I need revival. We all need it ourselves. We need to seek for it. Well, let's look at some of the things they did that helped prepare the way for the outpouring of the Spirit. First of all, they got together. Acts chapter 1, they were in one accord. That means they were united. So what are they doing during those 10 days between Christ's ascension and Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is poured out? They're putting aside their differences. They're of one accord. You also find in Acts chapter 2, they are in one accord, in one place, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. So, step number one, be coming together. When there's a meeting, come. John 17, 21, this is the prayer of Christ. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. 
that the world might believe that you sent me, that the glory that you gave me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. You know, the Bible tells us there's one God. People get confused by that. And Jesus is saying, don't let that confuse you. It's the same kind of oneness that I'm asking the church to have. We're different people, but we're one. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three unique individuals, but they are one God. He wants us to have that kind of oneness like a husband and a wife, like God the Father, Son, and Spirit, Jesus is inviting us to be one. The only way that's going to happen is we have a special glue that you can't get at Home Depot. It's called love. That's what's going to weld us together. So they were in one place, one accord, and then came the sound of the wind. Acts 2, 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as it was a rushing mighty wind. Anyone ever been in close proximity to a tornado? I mean a real tornado. I'm not talking about one of these little devil dusters that goes across the sand. People I know tell me it's like a train is going by. It's a tremendously loud sound. And all of a sudden the people in Jerusalem, it doesn't say they got hit by a tornado. You notice it doesn't say they saw a leaf flutter. What does it say happened? they heard from heaven a sound. Doesn't say that there was a ripple in the breeze anywhere. The roar was a spiritual wind that came from heaven. Jesus talks about that wind. John 3 verse 8, Lord, let that wind blow again. Jesus said the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's talking about this spiritual birth that took place and there was a special birth at Pentecost. John 20 verse 22. What did Jesus do the first time the disciples received the Holy Spirit after he rose? It wasn't in Pentecost. Right when he rose it says he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit. What had happened before the upper room experience to the church? it had died. When Christ died, their faith died. You remember he talked to the two on the road to Emmaus. They said, Lord, they said, we thought he was going to be the one. We hoped he was going to be the one. They lost hope. They were discouraged. They'd been scattered and their faith had been completely destroyed. The church basically needed a resurrection. And when Jesus rose, it rose and sort of like artificial respiration he breathed into them and they came alive. That wind from heaven. And then it says after this wind there was a sign, something visible happened. Cloven tongues. Now I've seen that painted before and, and we've got a painting too where sometimes it almost looks like they get little, the little tongues that a serpent has. And I thought, well, there's something incongruous about that, having snake tongues coming out of their heads of fire. But the word cloven doesn't mean necessarily split. It means divided. It could be divided four ways. It was divided unto them each one. Of the 120 in the room, men and women received these cloven tongues. Why tongues of fire? Well, because sometimes the Holy Spirit comes like wind, sometimes like rain, like water, and sometimes like fire. Jesus said, Acts 1 verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Why didn't Jesus say, you guys, once I send to heaven, get to it and go out and start preaching? Why does he got to wait? Because they needed this power of God and they had to wait on the power of God. And sometimes God wants us to wait so we won't take the credit. We think we're making it happen. He wants us to know he's making it happen. Now, going back to this subject of the, um, the tongues, turn back with me to Acts chapter 2. I've got to take a few moments and talk about this because there's a lot, of, a lot of confusion. How many of you have seen uh, on maybe some religious channel or maybe you've been to a church or maybe you were part of a church? I was. Before I was a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I was a part of a church where it was very common for people in the middle of the service or at some point during the service to just start 
uttering out these incoherent sounds and it could sound to the average person like just babbling. And uh, they, you say, what is this? And they say, well, this is the Holy Spirit. Really? Where do you find evidence for that? It's Acts chapter 2. God poured out the Holy Spirit and they all began to speak with these other languages, speak in unknown tongues. Well, that's not what it's talking about. When Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, these signs will follow them that believe they will speak in other tongues. That word tongues there means languages. Now, Jews were visiting from all over the Roman Empire. Why? Because they'd been commanded in the law of Moses that 50 days after Passover you are to come to the place that I choose, Jerusalem, and there you're to make your offering, and there you're to celebrate and rejoice, and it was a great festival. And every Jew scattered all around the Roman Empire. Some came from as far away as Spain. They came from Africa. They came from Asia. They came, they were scattered everywhere. And they all would come to Jerusalem. And it was filled with thousands and thousands of what kind of Jews? Not any kind of Jew. God's timing is perfect. It says there were dwelling in Jerusalem because of the Pentecost feast, devout Jews. What kind of Jews? These folks believe the Word of God enough to make a trip that takes them months. They may not do it every year, but every Jew at some point in his life would come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And so here are these Jews from all these different parts of the world. They've come together and all of a sudden they hear this roar. They come to the center of town and now rushing out onto this balcony because they've come from the upper room are the apostles and their faces are glowing and they got tongues of fire and they're going, what does this mean? And all of a sudden they begin to preach in these different languages. Remember, I want to emphasize what it says here. Mention 16 different language groups scattered around the Roman Empire. It says, what is this that's happening? Look, are not these who speak Galileans? Verse 7, they were amazed. And he says in verse 11, we hear them speaking in our tongues, amazing babbling. No. Did they know what they were saying? We hear them speaking the wonderful works of God. Why did Jesus do this? Why did he say that you will speak with other tongues? For the spreading of the gospel. This is perfect. This is genius. He picks this holiday of a Jewish harvest. He pours out the Holy Spirit when not any old Jews, but devoted Jews who are looking for the Messiah to come. They come to Jerusalem and they're so angry they see the Roman flag there hanging above the courts and they say, oh Lord, send your Messiah, send your Messiah. And in the context of that thinking, God pours out the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and then they come pouring out of this upper room speaking to them about the Messiah in their native tongues. They hear the truth. Thousands are converted. They then take the knowledge back to their countries. What a wonderful UPS system for the gospel in the first century. Let them do, it created basically a gospel pandemic in one century because of Pentecost. Because God chose that convocation where they had come from all these different countries to pour out His Spirit. Go back to Acts chapter 2. And I really like this in verse 14. Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and he says, Men of Judah and all you who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and heed my words. He's saying, can I have your attention please? You're wondering what this noise is? You're wondering what the fire means? I've got an announcement to make. Can I have your attention? These are not drunk as you suppose. This is only the third hour of the day. They hadn't even had breakfast. But this is the fulfillment of a prophecy. And he begins to use scripture. And he talks about how God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh and you're seeing the fulfillment of that. And then he says in verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. I'm making an announcement. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know, the one who was just crucified 50 days ago, the one that you thought was a false prophet, he was the Messiah. Now you and I today, there's nothing I can say, there's no way that I can communicate to you how those words absolutely knocked them off their pedestal with a baseball bat. Just it totally shook them to the core that he should stand before the Jews who for 2,000 years were saying, when the Messiah comes, when the Messiah comes, when the Messiah comes. And now Peter stands up and says, he came 
and you crucified him. Can you understand a little bit of what a bold announcement that was to them? Now, what does Peter do when the Holy Spirit is given? He's given the Holy Spirit for the purpose of preaching. Matthew 4, 17, Jesus is baptized, and what's the first thing he does when he's baptized? Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 9, 35, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Why is, has the Christian church exploded around the world? Because of what we're doing right here. We gather together and listen to the preaching of the word. The Holy Spirit being poured out at Pentecost set the stage for what? For Peter to preach a sermon unlike any sermon they'd ever heard before that then resulted in people's hearts being changed, accepting Christ, receiving eternal life, and becoming part of the church. And it happened through the vehicle of preaching. And then as a result of this, Peter preaches, they were convicted. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? He invited a decision. And he said, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. And God will give you the Holy Spirit for the promise is made unto every one of you and your children, as many as the Lord God shall call. Those that gladly received his word, there was a harvest from that, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 were added, just that day. You keep reading, and there were thousands being baptized because it's a harvest that's happening. We need that rain now, don't we? In our church, we need the outpouring of the Spirit you know, one of the amazing facts I did a couple of years ago was regarding these, uh, the longest living insects are the cicadas. How many of you have experienced sometime or somewhere in your life an eruption of cicadas? It, it's a very amazing thing. It's more prevalent back east, but you'll be driving through the country and all of a sudden you can roll up your windows. There is this ear splitting noise that is deafening. The bugs go underground. They, they kind of nurse on the sap of tree roots for 17 years in kind of a dormant state. 17 years. And then, all at once, just by some divine clock that they've got, they all feel this urge. Even though they're not touching each other or talking to each other, they're all underground. They just get this urge to go up. They want to go up. And they start to climb out of the ground. And then that's not enough. Then they got to go up more. And then they start climbing up trees. And somewhere on their way up, they say, this is as far as I'm going to go. And they lock their feet and they go through a metamorphosis. And all of a sudden they emerge from these bug shells and they got wings. And now they're overwhelmed with love. And they want to find another cicada to love. And so they start singing these love songs. And it is the loudest bug in the world. It is ear splitting. And they're just jubilant. And they're making all this noise. And you know what's, they don't bite. They don't sting. They just sing. They don't hurt anybody. And they're very sacrificial. You know, they, they become really a feast for all the other creatures for a while. They just, a lot of them die. But all they want to do is they want to get up, they want to sprout their wings, and they want to mate, and then they die till another 17 years. But it's just, it's like a wave that comes over all of a sudden. If you're driving through country one day, and then a couple days later, the cicadas hatch, and then it's all gone within a week or two. It's quiet again for 17 years. Well, we need an explosion like that in the church, don't we? I'm not just talking about the ear-splitting noise. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit that will move us to rise higher. That's going to come through our seeking after God and praying for His Spirit, friends. And I see what's happening in the world, and I think, Lord, I know I can't make you send the Spirit, but I want to do everything in my heart I can do to be prepared when it happens. Don't you want to have that experience, friends? To be prepared in your heart for the outpouring of the Spirit. Is there something we can do? We read this to you earlier. Through prayer, putting away of sin, preparing ourselves before God, empty ourselves of selfishness and the things that are obstacles, making some changes in how we live and what we do, 
we can prepare our hearts to receive the Holy Spirit. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this week's special offer. God is invisible to us, but does that mean he's less real? There's a whole spiritual world that we can't see and most of the world is blinded to that. Jesus came to make the invisible visible. Every day, people spend about seven hours and 45 minutes sleeping, 17 seconds brushing their teeth, one hour and 15 minutes eating, four hours and 50 minutes watching TV, and 33 minutes on the phone. With only 24 hours in the day, where does God fit in? Moving Mountains, a new daily devotional. It's about understanding God and building your faith. With 366 short stories to inspire and encourage, your day will never be the same. AFBookstore.com, life-changing Christian resources. journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save His children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. The power of the disciples was not truly realized until they were all in one accord. The power of the Holy Spirit is the driving force for all true conversion. The Spirit of God was present at creation and at significant moments throughout the Bible. Jesus mentioned he would send the Holy Spirit as a comforter for all those who believe. What is the true purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Do we need the Spirit? We've prepared a beautiful book dealing with the subject of the Holy Spirit. It's entitled, Holy Spirit, The Need. You will be blessed as this study resource reveals a loving God and His desire to grant us full access to heaven. Please visit our website, amazingfacts.org, or call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 723. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until next time, friends, remember these words from Matthew chapter 28. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. 